All right, so I unbuttoned her up and um, took a quick peek inside. But first, I want to show you that um, fortunately, this cover had better days. I don't know if the camera can focus, but is um, this thing got damaged? I don't know if you could see that. Oh, crap. Okay, this camera focus, but anyways, the, the cover is damaged. It got damaged in uh, in transport. If you can see, it's bent over there. Um, and then front a little bit not to worry about this. This is a just a minor problem I got a magic eraser that's gonna take care of all those bends um, well, Anyway, so we'll, we'll get this resolved, but yeah, let's talk about what I found inside this thing. So uh, All right, uh, it looks like a pretty clean unit. It doesn't look molested in that sense. It's not it's it's dirty It's got some dust and stuff in here, but nothing Nothing major, some signs of corrosion, and I'll get to talk about that in a little bit. I will, when this thing is apart, I'll take a close, uh, I'll, I'll share some of the close uh, um, footage of that. So let's talk about what goes wrong in a B2 usually. What is, uh, oh, first of all, I just want to mention that, uh, you see, I'm not uh, worried about getting electrocuted. The caps have been discharged or checked that they are discharged. I haven't plugged this thing in. I never plug in the unit that comes into my, um, and, 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 you know, that I get that I don't know. Um, um, the owner told me he he plugged it in, he tested it, and then he sent it to tech for repair. But so I'm not sure how long ago it was plugged in. But uh, and then nonetheless, I did I did make sure that there's no voltage. If you ever taken one of these apart, you're attempting to do any repairs to it, you need to make sure that between this red and white wire, you have zero volts. Um, you know, um, or between red and black and white and black, it's that's the center ground, or between the two of them. But anyways, if you have any voltage in here, you have good chances you could kill those refits if you, uh, let's say, you should lose, um, um, you should lose gate current or something like that. Anyways, but I'll, I diverse. That's something that I'm, I may or may not go in in, in the future, but in, into it later. But anyway, so. Um, what what's what goes wrong with these things usually? It's it's mostly the selector switches and the pots. Like this, by far has the highest uh, uh, rate of complaints comparing to anything else in this amplifier. So these things go bad uh, because of age. Um, this is not an this is a Yamaha design, but it's not a Yamaha component. These are pretty much just Alp switches, Alp po Alps pots, and they are not the. And I say they're not the top shelf grade Alps switches, but nonetheless, because of age, they get in dust, smoke, uh, they oxidize and they go bad. They have silver plated contacts and those silver plated contacts, silver, ox silver oxidizes, it gets a bit black patina on that and just loses conductivity. And so, what people usually do, they spray a bunch of the oxide here, hoping it's gonna get it fixed. And if that doesn't work, some technicians will take the assembly apart, clean them. And what I've seen in most cases, they do use abrasive materials, which essentially does worse than good because it essentially could exfoliate and can just erase out. It just damages the the silver plating, and now you have pure brass and. Um, I'm, you know what, it just, it's just a matter of a few weeks, a month later, then you're going to have the same problems again. So this, this by far, this by far Achilles heel when it comes to the B2, um, is one of the complaints why this amplifier is not actually considered to be more audiophile because it's got all the switches and things that like an audiophile doesn't want. But a lot of people appreciate having two inputs. Like I personally appreciate having two inputs, um, I don't mind having, um, um, you know, a gain control on the amplifier, although I, you know, keep it up all the way to the right and I use the preamp gain control. But nonetheless, you know, I, I do like to have that option. I'll be honest. I mean, I don't consider myself to be an audiophile and, you know, I'm not that much of a purist when it comes to like having nothing in a signal. By the way, this is a direct couple design um, there is a way to couple and decouple the input capacitors here, but other than that, there's nothing in a signal path. So many will argue like, why don't just run a um, a direct uh, wire straight to the driver boards and get everything up? Well, that's you know, 
you're gonna have all these buttons and switches that are useless that's first of all second of all like I said it's just um, I, I do not mind uh, I took the buttons out uh, I do not mind having you know toggling between two inputs you know I just like that so I, I do have a solution for this that is uh, it's not the typical um, Anyways, we'll talk about this a little later. So, in short, this is the Achilles heel. This must be addressed a, at a very minimum cleaning, clean, but again, it will, it will, the problem will resurface, right? So, but this is the Achilles heel for the B2 amplifiers by far. I've seen over a dozen of these, and most of, most of them, all of them needed this uh, addressed, right? Even if it still works, it still needs to be addressed because if it still works, it's just a matter of time. It's like still cracking and stuff. So, that's a problem. Um, sometimes I do see uh, the power switches uh, be um, go bad. It's not a contact per se. It's not a contact inside. It's a snap switch. It's a serious thing. If you open it up, you would see like this is uh, this can take some amps and it's 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 well built. Contacts are, you know, it's not they're not going to be your problem. The problem is um, the the latching mechanism. Uh, that sometimes gets uh, grime in there. Uh, people try to use all sorts of chemicals to lube it, um, and what that bind, that thing that binds up and makes the mechanism, the mechanical portion, um, gets stuck, get hard, gets hard to operate. And that's sometimes what you will see. You see one of these with the front button, front power uh, plastic broken because somebody tried to essentially use brute force to. Um, get the switch to engage and it just breaks because the mechanism so this needs to be taken out clean and it works again for a while but um, I, I don't usually replace this I would you know uh, I, I'm gonna see what I'm gonna do with this unit. this this switch is just like perfect I may not replace it at all um, you know one alternative is a, a, to use a, 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 a track but that's something else um, right um, well so we talked about the Achilles heel the, uh, of, of this unit being the um, the selector switch. The second problem um, that needs to be addressed is um, it's what's happening here in this PS, in, in PSU assembly, power supply. Uh, because of the way that Yamaha designed it, this designed this as a lid. It's basically an oven with a heat trap. And this uh, this um, does a couple of things. First of all, yeah, it warps the board and gets gets hit up, and sometimes the resistors that I'll, we'll talk about in a little bit, they can be close enough to the board where um, they they actually make hit marks in there. That's not that's not my that's not my pet peeve. Problem is those big cans down there. I'm not sure. If, um, see them? All right, those four cans. The, those are main PSU caps. Those things have a relatively high failure rate. That's my opinion. That's based on my experience. Again, I've seen over 12 of these, maybe more. Um, and comparing to other amplifiers, the capacitors in the B2 um, fail. They, what happens to them, they leak. And I'm not talking about, um, I'm not talking about current leak. I'm talking about dielectric fluid leak, where they would just leak and you know everything would come on i think that's the case here like i said I, I, if i look down there i think that that's that's the case here i think they leaked uh, dielectric fluid but um it's just a matter of time when we're going to open it up we're going to look inside and see what happened um so uh because they operate on under uh this heat trapped inside here um their life is short another thing that happens is um People pull these things out of the storage after many years and they flip the power switch on. And that is not necessarily a Yamaha B2 issue. It's a general issue with vintage amplifiers because those old capacitors that haven't been used for so many years are dry and um, they will trip, they will, they will, uh, not trip, but they, the inrush current will, um, will basically kill them. Um, and you could, you know, could trip a fuse or two, burn a fuse or two because of it. Um, 
But what happens with the B2 in, that, in many cases is because they're already leaked and they already have, like they're really, really dry because of the heat problem, powering up the amp after so many years just makes things so much worse than possible without amplifiers. That said, let's not confuse the failure rate of the amplifier of the B2 with the failure rate of the capacitors. The B2 overall has a lower failure rate than others. It actually has a highest survival rate of all VFET amplifiers. Well, let's not talk about the B1, but the B2 has very, very good, um, you know, protection circuitry and it, it's, it keeps them alive. Certainly better than what Sony offered. Um, there are also other reasons why you see this more than Sony, but one of them is because they're Sony's, they had those dead diets, um, and they, they just didn't offer the circuit protection, um, as, as Yamaha did. Um, another reason is that this Yamaha just sold more of these, right? They sold over 10,000 of them, way more than like Victor JMS7 or Sony TA N7 and other things that were priced in the same price range around 200,000 yen back in 19 mid seventies. Uh, these guys, they just sold a lot more of B2, which is also a testament to their, you know, the, to the, to the quality of these units. I mean, not to the quality of the sound of these units, right? I'm, I'm, I love Sonys. I have a bunch of Sonys and then one day I will, will do some reviews on those. So there's just, I'm not saying one is better than another. I'm just saying that observing that back in the 1970s, the astute consumer of hi-fi consumer of the time, both in Europe, North America, and Japan, had the opportunity to listen to these side by side with, let's say, a Sony TN7, with a you know Victor JMS7, uh, with you know other Sonys and other amplifiers at the time. And for some reason, uh, and they're all priced in that range again. So for some reason, B2 sold a lot more units, even comparing to the B3, which was just a year younger and those are, you know, just completely outsold by the B2. And it's nothing like B, B3 is pretty much very closely be the same thing with this, except from, from that perspective is like they have, they don't have the switches. The B3s don't have the switches um, or not as many and just have pots. But uh, anyways, it's just, it's good, um, a good example where less is more because they don't suffer from the, uh, problems of the selectors which the B2 has, but otherwise they're identical. Except you know, essentially the B2 is a is twice the amp, right? It's twice the amp of a B3. Maybe that's why the detriment of the B3 was, you know, it's just you know a lesser amp, but price pretty high. So maybe that's why they didn't sell as many. But and by the way, this is not a dual mono. Just because it has two transformers, two separate amplifiers, um, it's not a dual mono. Just because the way the secondaries are wired. Um, I said I will drop in and out of details once in a while, and um, probably that's as deep as I would go. So uh, that said, I'll shut up, I'll take this apart a little farther, and I will come back.